Good evening, Nightwatch. I'm speaking to you once again in transit. And since I have nothing but rusted bulkheads to gaze at, I thought I'd while away a few hours by sharing a curious story with you all. This is going to be another one like I shared earlier, when we explored stories of floral creatures, cases that focus on individual encounters with strange entities, but which have little to no evidence to substantiate them. For tonight, I dug through some old files of mine and managed to turn up my notes regarding an older case, but one that is an enduring entry in the annals of the paranormal. It's a story that's long been a favorite of mine, even despite the frustrating lack of evidence associated with it. But like I said last time, you might even think of these as modern campfire stories and nothing more. So let's begin. In the autumn of 1964, a trio of friends were headed into the Tahoe National Forest, specifically the Cisco Grove area, where they intended to spend the weekend bow hunting. Among this merry band was 26-year-old Donald Shrum. Don was a local man, a defense contractor from Sacramento, California. He was accompanied by two of his co-workers, and the three of them set out early on Friday morning so as not to lose a single moment of precious weekend. They quickly established a campsite before hunting throughout the day. Come late afternoon, the men were ready to head back to camp, but along the way, Don ended up getting separated from the group. He began heading back in what he thought was the direction of his camp, but before long, night was falling and Don was fairly lost. He found himself on the edge of a cliff just as the last embers of daylight were dying in the sky, and it became readily evident to Don that he was not going to be able to find his way back to camp before nightfall. But this wasn't a huge deal. Don was an experienced outdoorsman, and he was more than capable of spending a night out in the open on his own. But nonetheless, he began backtracking, hiking through a narrow canyon filled with some sparse vegetation. It was while he was headed back the way he came that he noticed some alarming sounds emanating from the nearby brush. He heard a thrashing noise, as though some kind of large animal was tramping through the undergrowth toward him. Don immediately feared the worst, assuming that it was a bear coming through the duff toward him. After taking a moment to assess his surroundings, he made for a nearby tree that was roughly 30 feet tall. Near the base of its trunk, it had little in the way of branches. The whole thing was mostly bare of leaves to begin with, but the tangle of boughs thickened further up, making for a decent place to hide. Don removed his belt and then used it to shimmy up the barren stretch of bark near the bottom until he could properly climb up into the thicker branches. Once secure in the tree, Don stayed up there for a while but the bear he feared was prowling about in the woods nearby never materialized. Once he was satisfied that whatever interloper may have been present was gone, Donald returned to terra firma. But by this time, night had truly fallen. There was moonlight, but it would still be very dangerous to try to pick his way through the woods back to camp on his own. Rather than trying to retrace his steps to the campsite, Don instead chose to light a trio of small signal fires, which he helped might guide either his friends or any rescuers they may have contacted to his location. With his beacons lit, he then returned to the tree to settle in for what was probably going to shape up to be a long night. Of course, Donald had no idea just how long it would prove to be. After spending a while longer nestled amongst the boughs of his chosen tree, Don spotted something off in the distance that immediately drew his attention. There was a white light in the forest a fair distance away. At first, Don's heart soared when he saw it. He thought that it might have been his friends or some park rangers picking through the growth in search of him. But then he noticed that it was moving strangely for a flashlight or a lantern in someone's hand. As it moved, Donald noted that it was not in fact down in the trees, but rather skimming over the tops of them. Initially, he assumed that instead of a ground party, he was instead observing a distant helicopter. His friends must have contacted the park service, who then dispatched an air patrol to comb the woods for him. Excited, Don rummaged through his gear and produced a signal flare, which he ignited and waved in the air to draw the attention of the distant light. Sure enough, the light shifted course and began to move toward Don, but as it drew closer, he began to doubt whether his initial conclusion had been correct. What tipped him off was the lack of any engine noise. The light moved silently through the air. And then he thought he could spot a series of dark shapes hovering alongside the light, set at equidistant intervals around it, though nothing in the way of details could be made out. Realizing that something was wrong, Don dropped the flare and pressed himself into the tree. The light finally stopped about 150 feet away, and then it began to circle around the tree, as in the darkness, two objects appeared to drop off of it to the ground nearby. 
It was at this point that Donald noticed a separate dome-shaped object hanging in the air about 1,500 feet away. He didn't get long to dwell on that, though, as there came a new rustling from ground level. Through the undergrowth, a humanoid figure emerged into the clearing near the base of the tree. It was reportedly about five and a half feet tall, dressed in a suit made of a silvery material that was wrinkled at the joints, as though to permit them to flex. The whole suit was in one piece, from the ankles all the way up to a hood that rose up over the head and featured a hole for the face. There was no discernible neck on the creature, and the silver hue of the suit reflected so much of the moonlight that the facial area was obscured in darkness, but it reportedly appeared as though the humanoid wore some kind of face mask, perhaps a respirator apparatus or something similar. Additionally, the eyes extruded so far out from the creature's skull that Donald assumed them to be goggles. At first, the newcomer didn't seem to notice Don up in the tree. Rather, it appeared much more interested in the ground-level plant life. But shortly thereafter, another one, just like the first, emerged from the other side of the clearing and joined its partner. Then they both began to emit cooing sounds compared to those of owls. After apparently communicating with each other for a stint, they turned their attention to Don in his perch. They moved up even with the tree, and they began to push against the trunk with gloved hands that sported very long fingers. This was assuredly unsettling, but while this was happening, a new noise emerged from the forest nearby. It was a fresh rustling, accompanied by some crashing sounds and a humming noise like that of an electric generator. The genesis point of these sounds quickly revealed itself, another humanoid, but one that was very much larger than the two at the base of the tree. This one was very boxy in the torso and head. It lacked a neck like the two others, and it had a pair of round eyes which glowed orange in the dark. Its jaw was extremely square, and when it opened its mouth, its entire mandible dropped away, creating a rectangular opening. It was metallic gray from top to bottom, and Donald actually later described it as looking like a generic sci-fi robot from a 1950s movie or comic book. This new metallic behemoth came to rest inside the clearing, while down below the two smaller humanoids attempted to boost each other up the tree. They made several attempts to climb up toward Donald, but they repeatedly failed. Donald said later that it appeared that they simply did not know how to climb a tree. At this point, Don was thoroughly spooked, and had apparently decided that the inexplicable trio had no kind intentions for him. He decided that he could not afford to sit complacently in his perch any longer. He had been hunting most of the day, and thus had shot off most of his arrows, but he still had three arrows in his quiver along with his bow. First, he took off his belt and used it to secure himself to the trunk of the tree. Then, knocking the first arrow, he took aim, not at these smaller, more organic-looking targets at the base of the tree, but rather at the hulking machine behind them. He let the arrow fly, and it struck its target right in the center of the chest, but it glanced off at the robot's outer skin, striking sparks as it did so without inflicting any obvious lasting damage. Undeterred, Donald shot off his two remaining arrows, but with similar results. Two more hits, but no damage. Following this ranged assault, the two smaller humanoids backed off from the tree and seemed to order their automaton forward. It moved up to the tree and opened its mouth, from which was emitted a cloud of gas that rose like smoke up toward Donald. When the cloud reached him, it made him immediately lightheaded, and then he gradually slipped out of consciousness as the noxious fumes wreathed around him. Luckily, though, his belt was enough to keep him from toppling to the ground. When he came to again, it was still dark and the three humanoids were still gathered at the base of the tree. Don had no idea how much time had passed. It could have been minutes, or it could have been hours. But once he was awake, he was feeling nauseous, though that didn't stop him from scrabbling up further into the tree and belting himself into a new position. Once he had reached a higher vantage point, Don got straight to work figuring out how he was going to keep fighting back without any arrows to launch with his bow. Eventually, he took off his cap and pulled a book of matches from his gear. Luckily for Donald, hair oil was all the rage in the mid-sixties, and it proved flammable enough to turn the cap into a veritable firebolt. Don lit it with the matches, and then launched it down at his assailants. His flaming riposte didn't do much in the way of damage to his attackers, but it did prompt another gas barrage from the automaton. Again, Donald lost consciousness, but when he awoke to find the situation largely unchanged, he set to lighting other articles of clothing on fire to hurl down at the humanoids. For several hours, this duel played out, with the robot releasing more of the anesthetic gas, only to prompt Don to retaliate with a fresh wave of burning projectiles. But eventually, Don ran out of matches, and so he took to finding new missiles. 
Growing desperation resulted in him launching his bow, his canteen, and even a handful of pocket change down the tree in defiance. As this all played out, the smaller humanoids continued their unsuccessful attempts to scale the tree. Eventually, the sun rose over the tree line as a new day dawned. But unfortunately for Donald, his ordeal didn't end with a sunrise. In fact, it got worse, as another identical robot, like the one he had already fought all night, emerged from the trees and took up a position next to its twin. As this happened, the smaller humanoids moved back, perhaps to give space to the two robots for what happened next. They both turned to face each other, and reportedly, belts of electricity began to arc between the robot's chests as a glowing mass began to form between them. From this mass, a fresh cloud of the same gas Donald had all too much experience with began to form, crawling up through the air toward him. Just as had occurred before, the gas rendered Don unconscious, and once again he awoke an indeterminate length of time later, though this time the humanoid marauders, all four of them, were gone. In fact, there was no sign that they had been there at all. Cautiously, Donald absconded from the tree, nearly panicking when he spotted a vaporous fume rising from the ground nearby, but his fears that the nightmare would commence anew were allayed as he realized that it was just the smoldering remnant of one of the signal fires he had set the night before. He then began to move back the way he had come, hoping to find his way back to camp, but before he got too far, he collapsed from exhaustion. However, after a while, he heard the sound of whistling in the distance and managed to use it to find his way back to his friends. He told them everything that had happened, and it turned out that his companions had an interesting story of their own. Apparently, the night before, they had seen a cigar-shaped UFO in the night sky, and further reported that they had seen a smaller, round UFO dispatched from it. After returning home, Don stayed silent for a long while regarding his encounter. He was left rather shaken in its wake, understandably, and he feared that if he revealed what he had seen to any sort of authority, it may have jeopardized his job working on missile systems for the federal government. According to Don's wife, he suffered from severe anxiety following his night-long battle with the unknown entities. But eventually, Donald's dedication to duty overruled his fear, and he delivered a report to the Air Force. Rather bafflingly, the Air Force decided that Don had been the victim of a prank, though knowing what we do about the typical handling of UFO reports by the Air Force during the 60s, it shouldn't come as a terrible surprise. Donald reportedly took the whole situation much more seriously. He was afraid that the gas he had been exposed to may have poisoned him in some way, though fortunately he suffered no obvious physical ramifications. Additionally, Donald made no attempts to monetize his story either. There is a book about it, entitled Aliens in the Forest, the Cisco Grove UFO Encounter, but it was written decades after the fact by a pair of MUFON researchers, Noah Torres and Ruben Uriarte. This case remains, at least in my humble opinion, as one of the most fascinating and alarming, though poorly substantiated, encounters in the paranormal repertoire. This case is a tough one because of the complete lack of evidence. We have to take Donald Shrum at his word. There's nothing else to go on. But if we allow ourselves to assume that he's being truthful, it seems very easy to chalk up his encounter to extraterrestrials. We have multiple UFO sightings, humanoid creatures in what appear to be environment suits, as well as what would certainly qualify as hyper-advanced robotics technology for the day. But what torments me endlessly about this story is the strange, chronic ineptitude demonstrated by all of the reported beings. The small humanoids couldn't figure out how to climb a tree, even though they seemed to have descended from some kind of advanced aircraft? They couldn't use their robots or their vehicle to dislodge Don from the tree? Unless that wasn't their intent. If we want to step outside the realm of extraterrestrials, we could toy with the idea of interdimensional beings of some sort. Perhaps it was not a spacecraft, but a dimensional vehicle of some variety. There have been some paranormal enthusiasts, like the rather famous, or, or infamous, depending on who you ask, John Keel, who have suggested that paranormal sightings of all sorts, be they ghosts, UFOs, or cryptids, all constitute interdimensional beings who may be interested in feeding on human energies, most potently fear. We'll assuredly be discussing the ultra-terrestrial hypothesis in much greater detail later on, but for now it may serve as a potential explanation for why what appear to be highly advanced beings on the surface may engage in baffling or seemingly inept behavior. On the more grounded side of things, we might consider that Donald may have been uh, intoxicated in some way, 
It was the 60s. Certain substances were growing in popularity. But as far as I can tell, Donald had no history or apparent interest in such mind-altering substances. I'm not convinced in the least by the prank explanation. It would be possible, but extremely difficult to pull off a prank like that. High-quality costumes, incredible props, and what about the gas? Was a group of pranksters really hauling around gallons of chloroform just for a gag? Failing all of these, a paranormal explanation, a prank, or the result of intoxication, we're left with the possibility that Donald was simply lying. Now, I never like to assume that a witness is lying. I don't want to tarnish a person's character based solely on speculation, but it is always a possibility that we have to keep in mind. Though in this case, I don't see a reason why Shrum would lie. He didn't try to make any money off of his encounter, and from what I've seen, he suffered quite terribly as a result of his ordeal. We could speculate for hours, but in the end it'll do us little good with no evidence to work with. Though regardless, I find this story to be endlessly fascinating. It's certainly cinematic enough to be made into a movie, and I'm frankly surprised Hollywood hasn't gotten its hooks into this story yet. But that being said, it's a relatively lesser known case. I'm glad I get to share it with all of you. And I hope that it'll get you all thinking the same way that it does me. That's all I have for this recording. Just a quick dive back into the case files. I probably won't be able to contact you again until I've arrived at my intended destination. So until then, stay tuned, stay vigilant, and man the watch. <laughs>